Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, as Heather says, uh, this session is going to be run. We have an R. It's going to be run jointly by myself and Helen Hurst. We're both in the Hempson's Charities and Social Enterprise team. We're a national firm of uh, lawyers specialising in this sector. And increasingly, we're seeing not only talk about collaborations, but people actually wanting to do something about it and make it happen. So I'll let Helen introduce herself uh, uh, when she picks up on her part. I'm Ian Hempseed and I'm the head of Charities and Social Enterprise at Hempson's. As the title says, the focus on this session is about planning, strategic planning. It's about the importance of early stage planning. It's are you prepared to commit yourself to invest time in the planning and in making it happen. It's about being proactive, not reactive, so not waiting for opportunities to come up, where if you're in a commissioning landscape, you may find the timetable for you to collaborate and find partners is far too short for you to even make a bid, let alone a successful bid. And so following on from that, a lot of this is about don't miss out on opportunities. I believe there's always a question about mindset as to whether collaborations are actually going to happen and if they do happen, whether they're going to be successful. So for me, the key is the mindset both of the board and the senior management team. Is it their intent to maximise their impact to their organisations, for their users, for their beneficiaries? The more that is a priority and less so on merely wanting to preserve your organization, you're more likely to embrace collaboration and in a successful way. Today, we're not talking about mergers. Um, we're not talking about VAT. VAT can be an important element of collaborations. You need to talk to your accountants about that. Before we start on the slides, I just want to start with a report which came out uh, in February last year. It was a joint report from Akivo, NCVO and Lloyds Bank Foundation, and it was called Rebalancing a Relationship. And in a couple of sentences, what I'm going to say is a very liberal uh, translation of what that uh, fairly detailed report said. It acknowledges, yes, there can be major hurdles with commissioners, or in the commissioning process, which affects the ability to collaborate. But the sector needs to look at itself, and often the problem can be within the sector as to how it thinks about collaborations, how it goes about it. So really what we want to do today is look at areas which are in the control of sector leaders and where you can take action. Why might you collaborate? There are lots and lots of reasons why you might collaborate. Therefore, from the outset, all parties to a collaboration need to be clear as to why they're collaborating, what it's for, do you have shared objectives? And the best test, if you ask each partner to articulate separately, why are we doing this? What are our objectives? And if, you, if, if there's common ground there, well, you're all off to a good start. But sometimes when we ask that question, we get entirely different views as to why people are collaborating. That is probably not going to lead to a successful collaboration. So I always feel that no matter how you set it up, in some document, at the beginning, state in a preamble, let's say to a contract, what are those shared objectives, shared uh, value aims you have behind the collaboration? So I've, I've set up various here. I'm not going to go through all of them. Sharing resources and information might be an end in itself, but it's sometimes a start to something more. Um, going down to combine to maximise your impact and offering. Again, this is to the strategic intent of the board. Is that where the board sees its priority? Sometimes you have no choice. If you want to stay in the game, Commissioners are scaling up. It could either be the financial standing of bidders, it could be the geographical extent of services, or it could be packaging up a wider range of services. If you're not prepared to join together, you may miss out on those commissioned opportunities. And for some, it might be safeguarding the continuity 
and the quality of what you already do, finding more effective ways of using re your resources, which for many organizations has been a real demand on them as a result of uh, COVID. And a couple of final points. Are you clear? Are you collaborating for a specific project purpose or is this a continuing relationship? Because that could influence how you structure it. And the big reassurance is we're not talking about merger. We you will retain, you will collaborate for a specific project or purpose, but you remain a separate organization. You retain your sovereignty independence for everything else you do outside that collaboration. This is a discussion we often have with groups of organizations. It could be charities, it could be social enterprises, a real mix who are thinking of collaborating. What are the main concerns around collaborating? And these are concerns which sometimes are so strong that they prevent uh, collaboration happening at all. Common ones are loss of sovereignty of our organization. Is this an inexorable slide towards a merger? Is it going to weaken our brand? If we set up a consortium and that consortium brand becomes much stronger in the locality, is our own brand be going to become weaker with commissioners? We're concerned about reputational risk. We think we're excellent in the way we deliver services. We're not so sure about other partners. A concern of imbalance of power between the partners. Some are bigger organizations uh, than others. And following on from that, concern that we might not be treated fairly by the other partners. But what does fairness mean? And we'll we'll touch on that later. And again, um, following on from that, we won't have an influence in decisions. Fear of being dictated to by larger organizations or other organizations grouping against us. You need to stop and analyze. Are these real or perceived um, concerns? Often they're not real. But if they are real, they often can be managed, which is what we're going to talk about later. And I would say the key to overcome any real concerns is about building trust, but that takes time. Um, even when you've already worked together. Just before I talk about this, just something else on the last slide, we don't need to go back. Um, we, we've worked with uh, organizations who tell us we've actually collaborated in the locality for a number of years and we got to know each other well, we trust each other, chief executives, the chairs get on well, and then the opportunity comes up for a much bigger piece of work to collaborate on. And it's surprising how often when things get scaled up, people get more nervous and greater concerns arise. Again, it's the same point. Are these real or perceived? What are the risks? Can they be managed? We're going to pick up on all of that as we go through it. But on this slide, who might we collaborate with? Um, I think that the charities and there may be organized social enterprises which aren't charities, but I think organizations are getting better at thinking broadly as to who they might collaborate with. Charities don't just have to collaborate with charities. A community interest company doesn't just have to collaborate with a community interest company. Think widely who you might need to collaborate with to deliver what are the common objectives. So there's a, there's a list and it could be a combination of them. Just to be alert, if you are collaborating with a non, if you're a charity and you're collaborating with a non charity, you need to be aware of this charity commission guidance for charities with a connection to a non charity. Um, what that guidance is saying is it's not saying to charities you can't collaborate with non charities. It's saying just like you do with everything else, this is a matter of identifying risk, assessing risk and managing it. And as they say, the key risks of any collaboration could be around losing independence, conflicts of interest, reputation, and in particular issue for charities is be very careful that the way you collaborate doesn't mean you end up spending money outside your charitable purposes. And this is a series of questions. The next question is how might you do it? There are various ways of doing it, but in the time available this morning, we're just focusing on three ways you might structure yourself. Prime and subcontractors, 
a contractual joint venture or set or setting up a separate joint ven venture vehicle, i.e. a new legal entity. And please don't do mimic what you hear someone else has done. You first need to decide what your objectives are, what is going to be best to deliver your objectives, and then you decide and only then do you decide what is the appropriate way to structure it. And finally, you might collaborate by not doing anything yourself. So I've, I've called this cooperation. And this is where you decide that actually there are others who are better um, suited, capacity, skilled to deliver it. And our responsibility to our users and beneficiaries is actually not to do that work ourselves, but to enable others to do it. Um, and I'm always interested to hear there's often silence when I ask how many people have done it, and I'm not going to do, we're not going to do a poll today, but I'm always fascinated when I hear people taking that uh, decision, which is exactly right. You are there, you exist to serve your users and beneficiaries. What is the best way you can do it? It may not be you. So let's get down to the nitty gritty of how you might structure it. So I'm going to pass over to Helen now, who's going to take us through prime and subcontractors. So over to you, Helen. Thanks Ian and good morning everybody. My name is Helen Hurst and I'm an associate in the Chariot, Charities and Social Enterprise team and I'm based in Harrogate. So as Ian explained, I'm going to take you through the first of our, one of our suggested models. Um, this one being the prime and subcontractors model um, or you might refer to the prime contractor as being the lead contractor. So to explain that, there'll be the main contract with the customer or commissioner, and that contract will be with one of the organisations. So that is known as the lead organisation or organisation A, as shown on the slide. Then there'll, there'll then be a series of subcontracts, or there could just be one if there's only one subcontractor needed. Um, but you could, as shown on the slides, have a number of different organisations and there'll be a subcontract um, that puts the connection between organisation A. Um, and so organisation B might provide one element of the service, for example. Now, in order to be able to do that, you would need to be checking the terms of the main contract. That main contract might be drafted, for example, as part of a tender process, so it might already be set out for you. You need to be checking that it provides the ability the, for the main contractor to be able to subcontract um, because not all contracts do. Some of them, for example, require the consent. And in fact, some of if it's done as part of a tender procurement process, it might be that you actually have to provide details of the subcontractors as part of that process of the selection questionnaire when they look at the financial standing of each of the organisations. So it really just depends as to what process um, you're going through as to what the requirements might be around subcontractors. You might also want to put in place a joint working agreement between the parties, so organisation A, B, C, D, E, so that you have a sort of overarching agreement between you that just sets out, as Ian was mentioned earlier, the sort of the shared values, what it is you're working towards together. So um, in terms of the prime or lead contractor, the sort of benefit is that that lead contractor has the control. However, that also means it has the risk um, because the, con um, the lead contractor will be on the hook for the main contract. They will be having to make any payments or deliver any services required. So the prime or lead contractor needs to make sure that all the subcontracts that sit below it back to back with the main contract. And by that, we mean flowing down the risk that the lead contractors carry in um, to ensure that the lead contractor isn't exposed to risk. However, that's not foolproof um, because of course, any of the subcontractors could default on one of those contractors on contracts, so um, you would need to be ensuring that the subcontract also requires the subcontractor to indemnify the lead contractor 
if if that did happen. However, um, there is still a risk with that in the sense that if the subcontractor, for example, went bust, then they, um, you know, into liquidation, then there may be no value to that indemnity. So there's definitely a risk. But like I say, the lead contractor also gets to keep control of the main contract. From the subcontractor's perspective, um, of course, they will have less control because they're always having to do what the, the lead contractor is saying to them. Um, however, from the subcontractor's perspective, your risk is limited to the area that you're contracting in. So you're not exposed to the overall lead or head contract. You need to be make sure um, as a subcontractor that you'd re be receiving a fair share of the contract price for the element of the service that you're delivering. Um, and just to point out an obvious note, there would be no direct relationship between the subcontractor and the commissioner or customer. So that can be difficult um, and that's why that um, joint working agreement is really important so that you are working and collaborating together in order to maintain those relationship. And obviously you just don't want to make sure um, the sort of the danger of this sort of approach is that you can end up with silo services. Uh, it can be a bit disjointed. And it obviously the joint working agreement can help with that. Um, and it's about keeping those communication lines open. And it might well be that this particular approach is a stepping stone that you use to then go on to one of the other models. So I'll hand back to Ian, um, who's going to talk about the next model. I'm going to look here at a contractual joint venture. Um, and this may look very confusing because there seem to be arrows going all over the place. Um, and that's partly because this is a really flexible way of operating. It is some form of agreement between all the organisations. There may be a customer or commissioner at the top to whom you're jointly delivering, but there may not be. It may just be a collaboration amongst yourselves. But what binds you all together is some form of contract. So I called it a joint venture agreement. Um, and there could there may or may not be a joint delivery with a customer or commissioner. So this is a very um, flexible approach. You can really put in, you decide what you're doing um, and uh, yeah, you, you structure it uh, accordingly. Um, it avoids the extra regulatory burden of creating a new entity, which is the third option, which Helen will look at uh, next. So what might be this useful for? Well, it's commonly seen what maybe people are starting out on a relationship and they might start just by sharing some information, maybe sharing some uh, back office uh, resources. It may be where uh, like minded organisations come together and wonder if they could develop a new service or product. And so it's almost like a research and development exercise. There's really no commitment at that point. The commitment would only arise if they agree and identify something which could be delivered. Sometimes this might be used where, let's say, a couple of organisations come together and for the first time want to run a joint conference. They don't want to set up a separate entity. And so three organisations come together and saying we are going to plan through this arrangement um, how we run a jointly branded conference next year. What it doesn't do, and this is in contrast with what Helen will be discussing next, it doesn't ring fence risk. And going back to the uh, diagram, if you are dealing with commissioners, um, it won't work probably with the relationship with commissioners because commissioners don't like joint contract holders. They will want to have a lead who holds the contract. So in that situation, this could very much be the joint working arrangement to avoid silo services. It could exist at that level, as Helen mentioned, where you've got a lead subcontractor relationship. You need to be really careful the way you structure um, these joint ventures, particularly if you are outward facing and delivering um, services. 
have you been very clear in agreement demarcating who's responsible for what and the way you face with the outside world the outside world may think you're all jointly liable and then chooses if there's a problem chooses to go against the organization with the biggest pocket so there needs to be great care the way you structure this particularly if you're using this as a vehicle for joint delivery um, externally and sometimes the governance is weaker you may create so we've got a project board but what is the status of that project board does it have any authority to take any decisions do all decisions have to go back to the boards or the senior management team of the participating uh, partners and one area which is often not dealt with going back to that conference if material is being produced in that conference who is going to own that material the intellectual property the copyright in that material because if you have joint authors of copyright material under uk copyright law that is owned jointly by the authors i.e the organizations who could be producing it um, so as i say it's flexible but that doesn't mean there's a lot you need to think about to make sure it uh, it all hangs together. You manage liability, you manage risk. If any assets are created, who owns them? Can they be used after the joint venture ends? And beware, often what we hear is there is some working arrangement which hasn't worked out and it's become worse than that because people have had to go to a solicitor like us. And so we've got a problem. Um, and we may need to take some action against one of the partners. And sometimes the repost is, oh, it's only an MOU. We didn't sign a contract. So please, please ignore the title on any document. MOU is meaningless under English law. What matters is the substance of what you write under the title of the document. Was it intended to be legally binding? Was there sort of benefit flowing both ways? And is there certainty of subject matter? If you've got those three ingredients, you could have signed a legally binding contract, even though you've badged it as an MOU and may have thought it's just a statement of intent. We can never be held to it. So by contrast with this very loose structure, we're going to go on to a much more formal structure, which Helen's going to pick up now, which is um, taking the step of creating a new entity. Thanks. Um, so yes, yeah, so if you thought Ian's last slide was busy, um, this one's even busier. <laughs> um, so we'll just, I'll just give you a moment to look at that um, and obviously just to explain the difference between this and the previous joint vehicle, uh, sorry, joint, joint venture model. And the difference here being that you create a new entity. Um, so in the middle, you see new company entity. Each of the organisations that is collaborating will be either a member or a shareholder of that new company entity, depending on whether you're setting up a company limited by guarantee, in which case it will be members, or a company limited by shares, in which case it will be shareholders. See, that new company entity will have its own board, as shown to the right hand side of the diagram. And to the left, you can see that. It's that entity which enters into the main contract with the commissioner or customer. See, that entity is an empty shell, or certainly when it starts, it is. So it's probably not going to have its own staff, um, and therefore it needs to have a series of subcontracts um, with the same organisations that are collaborating. So the subcontracts are what you see sitting below. It's just the difference between this and the very first model I showed you is that the main contract sits with this new company entity or special purpose vehicle, some people like to call it, um, rather than sitting with the lead contract. And that's the way that you um, sort of control the risk, if you like, because it sits with that new company entity. It's also a good way to be building the brand um, because, of course, you can have it it really focused on this particular project um, and you can get a reputation and brand around that new company entity. And you can also build up a trading history, which will enable you to 
bid for future product, uh, projects. You might also need to have, we've described it here as a support service agreement, but like Ian said, I mean, you could call it what you like, really. It's just an agreement um, from a partner to the entity. So as mentioned, that entity might not have its own staff. So it might well be that one of the partner organisations or even a different company um, is going to provide the back office support to the new company entity. And therefore, you need to put an agreement in place to manage that. So obviously, if you're setting up this new separate company, because it's a separate legal entity, it contains the risk, as I've already mentioned, and also it can have very specific objects limiting the scope of that collaboration, usually to the scope of whatever contract it is you're entering in, into. Obviously, it, it will be empty when you start out, but in the future it could own its own assets. As mentioned, it can show its trading history. And because it's been set up as a, a new separate vehicle, it means you can very clearly focus on the governance arrangements. However, um, setting up a vehicle like this requires um, sort of to be quite diligent in how you approach it. And the ring fencing that you set up could all be broken if you don't um, follow proper administrative hygiene. And by that, we mean that you don't have the proper contracts in place. If instead you had a series of emails and it turned out that perhaps one of the um, collaborating parties had more of a lead role in all of this, that could expose that entity, um, you know, that, that collaborating entity to risk because actually it turns out that because there's no contract setting out exactly what's happening, you'll be relying on a series of emails um, and that perhaps de demonstrates that that lead contractor is on the hook. The other point to bear in mind is in terms of funding calls. If again you have the lack of contract or a lack of clarity in the contracts that you set up, um, there could be a demand to call on the members and shareholders I say I showed you that we were at the top of the diagram. Um, they could be caught to have to provide funding. So if you're going to go down this approach, it would certainly take a lot of time and effort to set it up. But if you're going to do it, you need to do it properly, is what we would say. Um, and also just bearing in mind in terms of indemnities, if any of the parties are providing indemnities, um, then, of course, that is another reason why the ring fencing of the separate company could be broken because you're backing that risk, basically. Um, and I think the other point just to appreciate in terms of joint venture vehicle is just, well, actually, with as with any of the models, if you're going to go down this route, you really need to be checking that that approach is going to be acceptable to the commissioner um, or customer. There's no point going down this route, and setting it all up. And finally, on this slide, just to mention that you would be likely to need separate VAT advice, which is not something we, we're covering today. Um, it is something you would need to look at. So we've obviously looked at the three models now, and we just thought we'd touch upon um, what you should be thinking about before and during the time you're collaborating, really. Um, and certainly before you st or at the very beginning of your collaborations, each of you as organisations need to be confident about your own objects. Like with anything that you do as a charity, you need to be aware that you need to be op operating within your charitable purposes. And it can be very easy in certainly in this collaboration world to experience what we describe as mission drift, um, where you start to move away from what your um, main charitable objects are because you want to do something for the greater good. But of course, you've got to do um, you've got to follow your own charitable objects. It also, knowing about your partners, I know it sounds obvious, um, but how well do you actually know the other organisations you're collaborating with? Do you have any sense as to how well run their services are? Um, 
what their customer care and complaints history is like. It, all these things are really important. And due diligence um, is often talked about in a very legalistic way in terms of, you know, if, if you came to us to do a due diligence exercise, we would ask a series of questions and you get a series of responses. But sometimes you know more about an organisation than we would ever find out by way of paper exercise. You talk to the people, you meet the people. Um, so it's really important that you get a really good idea, idea and in-depth sort of approach about your due diligence, thinking about who it is you're partnering with. And very obviously, are your other partners in good financial health? Um, obviously, finances are really challenging in current times, um, but you need to have an awareness as to how strong the finances are of the other people you're collaborating with, because you don't want to take on a position where you're having to fund other partners because they can't meet meet the um, funding requirements. And Ian's already mentioned this already, but having that shared values and vision is really important and setting that out in um, the MOU or whatever collaboration agreement is that you're using. Um, oh yeah, and I think the only other point I'm just going to make on that is just about the assets and intellectual property. So if you're going to be using um, you know, joint use of resources, it might be office space. Um, it could be just the branding of one of the club, one of the organisations, or even of the of the joint venture vehicle. Making sure that you've got the appropriate agreements in place to allow for use of those assets and intellectual property. Thank you, Helen. Um, so I'll I'll take over here on the next few slides. We should have mentioned at the, at the beginning that uh, we will allow some time at the end for questions, and you can also put questions in the. Uh, uh, chat room. So I'm going to talk more now about the approach to how you structure the due diligence within whatever structure you use. Um, but I will just make one final comment because this is all about approach on due diligence is that um, it should be proportionate. It can be very daunting for a smaller organization if they get a massive um, checklist to answer and they've got very few resources to answer it. It should be proportionate. Focus on what you need to find out. What are the risks you've identified? We've talked variously about the need to build trust. Um, due diligence is one way you can alienate people by a totally disproportionate approach. So a proportionate approach. What I'm looking at on this slide is these are some questions we often ask. So what are you going to, this is all early stage planning. What are you going to prioritize to make a successful collaboration? If we had more time, we could do it as a, a poll. These are some essentials for me. Are your board and the chief executive senior management team on the same page as to aims and outcomes? Are you clear about what's in the collaboration and outside the collaboration. That should be absolutely clear. And it goes back to my point at the beginning. Everyone, if asked to articulate what the shared objectives should came up, come up with the same response. And when we have done this as the poll, trust between partners always comes out as number one. How are we going to build trust? Best way of building trust or to give yourself a chance of building trust is to allow time to do so. And this often comes up. We're worried that there won't be fairness and equity between the partners. So we ask, well, what do you mean by that? Can we be more specific? And so fairness and equity, if you drill it down, could be concerns about fair allocation of work and therefore who gets paid what, um, fair allocation of what resources is each organization going to have to bring in, what are the commensurate responsibilities, and are we clear how risk is being shared? So ideally, let's say if it's service delivery, you are responsible as a subcontractor, if that's the arrangement, your risk is around the services you are, you are obliged to deliver within your parcel. Your risk shouldn't extend to failure by other partners. Sometimes it can be territorial, toing and froing. Which region are we going to have allocated to provide these services. And what about managing partners quality of service delivery? How are you going to ensure 
for the user, the beneficiary, there's a seamless service because all partners are applying the same quality of service. And how are you going to ensure that that happens? And this really links into the next bit. Um, you hope you don't get there, but when you start off, are you going to be willing and robust enough? And I use the word robust enough to deal with poor service delivery. Lawyers can write in all sorts of mechanisms to deal with poor service delivery, but unless there's a willingness and robustness of board senior management team to action it, the legal documents won't won't take you very far. It's all about the attitude you bring. So why wouldn't you have the attitude to deal with poor service delivery? If your focus, the reason for collaboration is a better service, better impact, then why wouldn't you deal with a poor service delivery? Because that is affecting the experience of your users, beneficiaries. And behind all of this, are you certain you've got clear governance and delegated authorities, both between the partners, which is what we've been talking about, but what about within your organization? Has the board given clear delegated authority to the senior management team as to how they're going to run that collaboration? Do, do the senior management team, chief executive, um, have the flexibility, authority to take immediate decisions when required? And another one, and again, it's a common theme, is testing yourself. Is all this driven because we have a focus on maximizing impact rather than pure preservation of our organization? So a few tips about how you might make collaborations work. I would start and it's not here. Is is there strategic buy in from the board and the senior management team of your organization? Can they articulate what the shared objectives are? Um, have you articulated why this collaboration will deliver more for your organization or more for your users beneficiaries? Some collaborations need to operate very speedily. So let's say you, Helen's example of a new entity, you set up a new entity as a consortium ready to bid. That will not work unless the consortium board has the ability to decide and implement with speed. If people in that consortium board are always looking over their shoulder to their own organization, you'll never get you'll never get a bid in in response to an ITT. So and following on from that, is there robust and clear governance? And have you entrust decision making where decisions need to be made? Is it clear what decisions can be made by whoever is in, let's say, the the collaborative uh, board and what decisions are reserved for? Um, the partner organizations. So let's say you had to set up a single entity. Um, do you reassure people this is fairness again? Is there equal representation on the vote on the board? Is it one vote per organization on the board? Um, is it majority? Is it unanimous? Could one organization gang up on another and compel them to do something, incur an extra liability? And you must be open and transparent, and I would add honest. So this requires good communication. So work out how you're going to communicate with each other. Um, own up to problems so that everyone is alerted right at the beginning and there's therefore there's a good chance of dealing with it. And have you identified and shared risks? You should be approaching this just as you do with anything else with your risk register. A new activity of your organization, have you looked at that and added it to your risk register and identified risks, the likelihood of those uh, uh, arising, the impact of those? Because it's really only if you've done that risk register exercise, do you know what you need to protect yourself against and what reassurances you need from others? And it also builds into proportionate questions you raise in due diligence. Have you identified at the beginning what each organization is going to bring to the venture? Uh, it could be back office uh, resources. It could be intellectual property. Helen's already talked about intellectual property and due diligence. 
absolutely essential if people are sharing intellectual property. It won't work if you find out a few months into the joint venture that one of the parties who said they will be providing these modules, these materials, and they turn around, sorry, we can't do it. We've just found we don't own it. So again, that is something you would test. That's a key risk, a key risk you test in due diligence. Helen's also touched on this. No matter how you structure it, this comes back again to risk. Have you checked whether liabilities are capped? And we've seen where there's a new senior management team come in. It's a long term project two years down the line. They look at the joint venture agreement and they find there are things in there which says um, if we're making a loss, uh, um, there can be a cash call on the members. So clearly that is not capping your liability. There can be provisions, the, the most risky provisions inserted are indemnities. And indemnity sometimes are not thought about. And indemnity should only be included if there's a risk you've identified and it's reasonable for another party to indemnify a party against that risk. Generally, you will only want to do that if the risk is within your control so you can manage the risk. And a key thing to remember, do not give indemnities uh, in respect of activities which are outside your objects, because what you could be doing is exposing your charitable funds to be applied for an activity outside your charitable purposes. This is a risk which the Charity Commission uh, raised in the guidance I mentioned right at the beginning, and that would be a serious breach of trust. So think about your funds. How are they going to be applied? Are they always going to be applied within our objects? Sometimes you might need to widen your objects to get around that problem. And just a few other um, tips. The battle of policies. Um, again, if it's service delivery, you will have all have developed your own policies. But if you want to provide a seamless service, um, it's not going to work if you all operate to different policies on key areas because you won't get commonality of delivery, of standards, of how you treat the users. So right at the outset, maybe due diligence stage, um, recognize which policies people can use of their own and which key policies you have to adopt. You will probably maybe adopt a policy of one of the organizations. And when you when you start on something, if it's long term, this may seem negative, but you should think about what happens if one of us, one of the partner organizations want to leave. How can we exit? Have provision for that. But also think about what have we created during this collaboration? Is there anything we've created we would like to take away with us and we've invested it and be able to use outside this collaboration towards our purposes? How to deal with partner failure? Again, people sometimes at the beginning don't like to talk about that. They feel it will destroy trust. You should talk about it because if your focus is on looking after your users and beneficiaries, you must be looking at that. Um, and so again, early information, a process to try and resolve before it gets too serious. Um, you could have step in rights. One of the partners could come in, um, but that's not going to work um, if uh, you're all specialists in your own field and you and you're reliant on each partner to do their own bit. And my final, so I, we seem to move slides, but on my, the last slide, my final comment was document to manage risk. Um, and Heather, can we just go back to the last slide, please? We seem to have skipped. Document to manage risk. Um, yeah, the legal documents we've highlighted in the different structures, that's one way you can manage risk. Um, if let's say you're in a tender situation, don't leave putting the documents in place until delivery date has started. Sometimes there are very short time scales in an invitation to tender. You're not going to be able to do a good bid and set up a collaboration from scratch at the same time. So the risk is, and this is my last slide, the risk in all of this is if you don't invest time early enough, um, you may not be able to, first of all, um, build a trusting relationship, which is essential for any collaboration. And also, 
when you've built that trusting relationship, you may not have enshrined it in the necessary structure to make sure that you deliver the best services, you can deal with problems, you can manage risk. So I'm going to stop there. Um, we've got about 10 minutes for questions, so we can either take questions in the chat or uh, if people raise their hands and I'll probably get Heather to to spot uh, if anyone's raised a hand. So um, Helen and I are going to stop there and we've got about 10 minutes. Um, if you have any questions. We've no questions in the chat box as yet, so if people would like to unmute themselves and ask their question for Helen and Ian, that would be great. Heather, am I right in thinking that the questions can be edited out if that's an issue for anyone on the recording? Absolutely, of course yeah. it can. Yes, yes. If you if you don't wish your question to be part of the recording, then obviously we can edit that out. No problem at all. And, and the other thing, I, I appreciate that sometimes if you start on something and it's confidential, you may not want to raise that. So if people want to email us and there are email details at the end, if you've got something very specific and sensitive, um, in the days when we we're all face to face and we could have that conversation over a cup of tea, you know, we'd be happy to sort of e email a response to you. If you're concerned about that. Oh, we have um, Tracy with your hand up. So if you want to unmute yourself, Tracy, and please ask your question. It was just really when you mentioned about cash losses, does that also include clawback? Because some contracts if you are a poor performing partner, may have in them clawbacks. That that's right. So particularly yeah. some grant agreements um, have have clawback. Um, so um, so that's that that's a risk you should always identify. Is there anything in the contract? Uh, you know, we may feel we've got a grant to do this, but is there any way that grant could be? clawed back and there could be various reasons that you've spent outside the purposes that uh, the funder says some of your expenditure you've incurred is ineligible or you haven't spent it at all. Um, so that's part of the risk assessment. You do a risk assessment on the contract and if you are making then sub grants, let's say you are the, the holder of the main grant agreement, but you are working with other people on the project, you must have sub grant agreements with those people, you know, it's the back to back Helen was talking about. So if the main funder makes a clawback and some of that clawback relates to a part of the project being done by another partner, you should be able to claw back from there. So you must have back to back grant agreements in place to protect you. Thank you. Thank you, Ian and David, you've got your hand up if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ian Helen. Very helpful as as all your sessions always are. Um, at the beginning, you you did say we're talking about collaboration and not merger, and that's that's fine, and it was very helpful in that context. So I just wondered if you could say a few words about why collaboration might be a better path to follow than merger, or um, you know the pros and cons of, of of the two approaches. Helen, shall I start on that? And if you think of anything else, do you want to add to it? Yes. Yes, that's fine. Um, so, um, so the advantage of collaboration is um, if you parcel it up neatly enough, it's clear that you are only collaborating on a specific thing and your organisation remains independent to do everything else it's doing. So let's say it's on a project or service delivery, you have identified that just for that one project or service delivery, you would be able to do more if you collaborated with everyone else, but you're not, that's all you're doing. So if you structure it well, it's parceled up. What you're not doing is giving away anything else you do um, into someone else's control. Um, so that's an advantage of collaboration. Sometimes collaboration is done as a first step towards merger. That um, you may decide that we could see in two years time there could be a benefit for both our organizations merging. So full merger, you get the benefits of full integration, um, sharing on uh, resources. You know, you may scale up, 
you may be able to provide a bigger offering to your um, beneficiaries. There can be lots of positive reasons for merger rather than the reason that you're in financial difficulty, you can't find trustees, you must merge. I'm thinking of the positives here. Um, some people will start on the collaboration, they'll identify a small project or it might just be sharing information. And if that goes well, that can be a great way to build trust, to get over some of the barriers which there might be amongst boards and senior management team. And people say, actually, this would be really good. We could do far more if we take this the full way and fully integrate. Helen, is there anything yeah. else you'd like to add? I would just say that I think that collaboration um, doesn't have to be forever. So like you said, it could be just be for a particular project, but also there could be an end to that project, whereas a merger, it's very difficult to unmerge once you've merged. Thank you. That's uh, helpful. Yeah, your exit strategy comment earlier, um, very relevant. So I think Helen, the last slide, did, 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 well, I think we have our, there's, uh, will you, you explain the feedback form and then we'll yes. give our email. Yes, absolutely. Yes, please do um, let us have your feedback um, along with any topics that you would like us to cover in future webinars, because that's um, hugely helpful for us. Um, that will be also in the follow-up email that comes through to you. There'll be a link to collect, uh, click through to that. So, um, and if you have any questions at all that you think of later on that you would really like to have um, a, a quick chat with Ian or Helen, then the details, contact details are at the end of the slides and also will be on the follow-up email. Ian. OK, well, thanks for and thanks so much for everyone for coming. Um, uh, we have kept within the R for you, um, so um, I wish I'll say goodbye from Helen and me and uh, and have a great rest of the day. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye.